Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thanks so much for joining me on this pre-recorded episode. Valerie Halverson, costume designer for Stargate SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe, is joining us today. She came in after Christine Mooney in uh, seasons 9 and 10 of SG-1, uh, followed in Christina McQuarrie's footsteps in seasons 4 and 5 of Stargate Atlantis, and was responsible for all of Stargate Universe, seasons 1 and 2. Valerie and I go way back, and so it is it is just a delight for me to sit down and talk with her for a little while, so I'm really looking forward to having her on. But before we get started, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience, especially now that Amazon is picking it up. Please also consider Consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend, and if you want to get notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live, and clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. Since this is a pre-recorded episode, I've uh, invited the community on YouTube to submit the questions in advance. I was very thankful for everyone who did. And let's go ahead and bring in uh, Valerie. Valerie Halverson, costume designer for all three television series, all of SGU and the later seasons of SG-1 and SGA. Welcome yeah. to Dial the Gate, Valerie. Thank you so much for being here. It's, an, it's a joy and an honor to be a part of this. D Valerie and I go way back. We go back to 2009 when I was pulling all of her stuff apart in uh, the uh, uh, preparing for the the prop works auctions, and we were we were going through costumes and because costumes was one of one of my focuses at that point, and we were having to select what to take with us. And I remember us having these debates about what what we could take that would be um, sellable, and you also had the the perspective of. Well, I put, you know, of course, you know, I put all this time into it and everything else. You know, it, this is what it means to me. This is what I think it would mean to fans as well. And I just remember those conversations with, with such fondness, you know, for the week and a half that we did it. It was, it was one of the best times of my life, Valerie. And um, I, I was so privileged to have get, got to know you and, and your team on that time. Thank you so much. It was a, a great team as well. And it was such an emotional time for me, not only because we were moving on from Stargate, but also because all of those costumes meant so much, you know, to me. So how did you get into this industry and how old were you when you knew that this is what you wanted to do? Well, I probably won't answer the end of that the uh, end of that question correctly, but uh, I will tell you that I sewed all my life. Like since I was a teenager, I sewed for people and for myself. I'm a bit of a tall girl, and so I was always extending the arms of my <laughs> of my jackets and stuff. That's how it started. Um, and then I realized that there might be uh, some sort of a career in this, so I went to fashion design school, and I came out of there, <clears throat> started working for a sportswear company in their design room while still sewing for people and then thought I wanted to branch out on my own. So I started uh, a line of clothing that I sold to boutiques around town, had a private clientele. And I was approached by uh, one store owner who's had, you know, sort of watched my evolution and said, I'd like you to be my sole designer in my boutique, which I did. We had a very successful uh, start to that. But unfortunately, a few months in, I realized that um, <clears throat> they were keeping all the money. So I was a creative person with not a good business head, apparently. And I had to extricate myself from that. And I had a friend who was in film, and she always seemed to be creative and engaged and energized. And I called her for advice. And she said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a really big show in town crewing up. And because you sew, yeah. Um, you know, you might have a chance. And I was I was lucky to get on it. It was called Eaters of the Dead when we were filming it. But when it went to theaters, it was the 13th Warrior with okay. Antonio Banderas and Omar Sharif. So that tells you a little bit of a timeline, <laughs> yeah. like 1997, 98. And uh, I got onto that show completely uh, naive, which I think was a blessing. And, you know, the first day I'm sewing moccasins. And then a week later, they're saying, can you sew some fur hats for us? And then a week later, they're like, do you want to try breakdown? And, and eventually they said to me, do you want to try making armor? 
and maybe this is part of my segue into into Stargate eventually, is I said, sure, yeah, what, you know, of course. And I was working with these incredible artisans, you know, who were making metal armor. Yeah. Like, and they taught us to make chain mail suits for, you know, for Antonio Banderas. And then we started making leather. And so I learned a lot of techniques. We would, we would build them from a skin right up to a painted piece of armor. And I then got to go on to set and dress the Vikings on that show because I knew how they all went together and everything. And, you know, eight months later, it was like an incredible first toe dip into the industry. And I fell in love with it. And then I just would, I just did everything. I was a personal dresser. I was a truck person on a Western. I was, you know, set person, whatever they asked any job that came along, I was like, sure. And, uh, and I actually, when I'm mentoring people and when I'm talking to my crew, I always say to them, do that, try everything because you will have a better understanding and whatever job in our department you land in, you know, not everybody's going to be a costume designer. You will have a better understanding and better knowledge of what, you know, entails to get there. I think the, one of the, the, the greatest things about that industry is the diversity in opportunity. And if you are willing to, you know, stick your, stick your toes in the water and try something different, you know, you may find a path that wasn't, that leads you down one that you didn't start where it's, you actually find uh, your, your true calling. You know, there's, there's, exactly. there's so much, there's so much opportunity in the industry there for people who are go-getters and who are like, you know what, let's try it. You know, I may fall flat on my face, but hopefully someone around me will try and catch me before I fall all the way. And you're, and you're always being asked to do something that appears impossible, but yeah. we don't use the word no when talking <laughs> to a director or a producer. We're always like, I'll get back to you on that or let me think on it. Yeah. And I found, you know, you really can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear you know, or, a, or an alien outfit out of a kitchen sink drain, you know. Wow. Before we get into Stargate uh, uh, and and further into your career, I want to move forward real quick. You just got off a project that um, sounds really fascinating from a, from a um, uh, historical, anthropological perspective. The show is called Mahalia, Mahalia. and it's the story of Mahalia Jackson. And Robin Roberts um, has been sort of commissioning these incredible stories of, you know, black history. And, and, uh, mm. and we were lucky enough to be on one of them. The star was Danielle Brooks. She was in a, she's an okay. amazing singer and talented um, actor. And the story took place from 1925 to 1972. And it was wow. uh, a story, a telling of a story that exists, right? So we wanted to be in some ways historically accurate. And in other ways, we wanted to tell a story that was topical because of everything that's happening. And so we mixed it up a little bit. Kenny Leon is a, is a Tony Award winning Broadway director and he was our, our leader. And he was so creative and um, it was just such an interesting, not even a challenge. It was absolutely an incredible project to um, recreate Martin Luther King's uh, walk on Washington, you know, and his I have a dream speech. And then we did Carnegie Hall. And the great thing was, I was able to design a lot of um, custom unique never seen before outfits. Some we tried to replicate and others were were um, fresh and new. And I had an incredible uh, cutter working with me, Samantha McKinnon. And between us, we built so many of the costumes for our lead. And I'm just, I mean, there's billboards in LA because it just aired. Okay. And one of, our, one of our creations is on it. And so it was just, it's really touched my heart, this one. So this is ha- has to be a radically different... Um... Uh, pre-production phase to something compared to Stargate because yeah. you are going into the past. And like you indicate, not only are you creating historically um, accurate, specific outfits, you also have the freedom to create period inspired costumes as well. So it's, a, it's something that, that you said that just now kind of surprised me. It's like you weren't always required to um, go to uh, uh 
the photography from the period and produce exactly everything that you saw from then, it sounds like you had creative freedom inside the period that as long as you were using certain types of materials and, and designs, they were, he, mm -hmm. he was game. And, and that was a, a wonderful freeing um, you know, thing for me is that to have such a creative director and of course a lead, a lead who was game as well. I mean, we did a lot of research on the period because we wanted the, the background and a lot of our supporting players to represent that period so well. And, you know, there's a, a whole different research involved in finding authentic period costumes, you know, rental houses around, you know, in North America. And, um, so we drew on a lot of those, but we also paired them with things like I would, you know, have a great sweater from the fifties, but put on something more modern underneath that um, was really special to our lead. You know, it was, and the jewelry, finding the jewelry. I mean, I had a, I just dove into those um, vintage stores like crazy every weekend. I was, <laughs> I was at them and, and because uh, it was a big show. Yeah, yeah. it was research, um, but it was a really big show as well. So um, there was probably 400 costumes in it. And, and, uh, but I have an amazing team and they were all, they jump into everything with me. It's amazing. Did you learn uh, anything from this particular project that you didn't expect to dipping into the past? Only, definitely you learn the history and, yeah. and it's always more than you knew before. Yeah. Uh, for me it is, you know, because we dove a little deeper. But mainly what I learned about was the community of that time and the support. And that was awe-inspiring to me, actually. And to see our actors together and how supportive they are for each other as a community. It was it was really a joy to be on that set. Were there parallels in that regard to your time on Stargate? Let's go into Stargate. What a journey. You know? And you were <laughs> that's quite a journey, yes. Yeah. The the uh the last costume designer of a a series. Uh I know Christina McQuarrie um started with SG1. And I'm mm -hmm. missing, I'm pretty sure I'm missing some names in between, but Christina and you are the ones that I always remember because first and last. Um, right. Tell us right. about that arc. Tell us about that period of your life that must have been, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but it must have been a whirlwind. It was a whirlwind because when I started on Stargate, I was on SG-1 and the other designer is Christine Mooney. Christine Mooney, thank you. I apologize, Christine. Yeah. No, she she's she's an amazing, um, amazing designer. And she took over SG-1 when Christina McQuarrie went on to take over Atlanta, Got Stargate it. Atlantis. So she'd been on it a few years when I joined her as her assistant in season okay. nine. And, um, you know, to just jump into that world was so creative to have a huge shop of builders and breakdown artists and leather workers. I mean, I was in I was in heaven, to tell you the truth. It was just so creative. And Christina was a, a gracious, elegant and uh, incredibly talented designer. Unfortunately, she had to step away in season nine uh, from the show. And Brad and Robert uh, gave me an opportunity. They, they said, well, let's see what she can do, yeah. you know? And uh, <laughs> I think the first one was the quest. And so Robert said, or John Lennox said to me, Robert would like you to do up some sketches and maybe, and you could meet with him tomorrow and see. And I, you know, so I went home that night. I have to admit, I probably didn't sleep a lot, but <laughs> I a did deal. have, uh, <laughs> it's a big deal. And I didn't know them that well. And yeah. Robert is a, is a really nice person, but he's a man of few words, Correct. which can be a little intimidating. Correct. And, um, and so I went home that night and luckily I had a design background from my own line of clothing. So I did up some sketches. I'm not a great uh, illustrator, but somewhere between beautiful and a stick person, I can get my point across. And um, one of my first designs was for, you know, Adria and she was going to be coming as the leader of the army, the Ori. And so I had this idea that she would be kind of a little bit of a spoilt rich you know, um, princess. And so she would come and look at the army and go, well, I want one of those. Like she's shopping at Barney's New York or something, right? I just want one and I want it to look good. So I designed this outfit for her that 
was similar to these beautiful, beautiful um, warriors that Christine Mooney had designed, but I shrunk it down and made it girly. Like she still had the pauldrons on her shoulder, Correct. but she had a bustier on and she had sexy boots on, but she had a gun belt. And, and I thought, you know, this would just be her. And um, so I took that in to show Robert. And I tell you, I went to his door and knocked on and he was like, come in. It seemed like about a mile to his desk and my knees were literally knocking. I was so nervous because this was a huge opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you're dressing Marina Baccarin for crying Yeah, Marina Baccarin, who, yeah. who was just such a joy. We did, you know, some, some great work together, I yeah. think. And uh, she embraced everything. And so I showed him the, the sketches and he was, he, he said, well, I didn't expect you to do this much. You know, I, I think we can go forward with this. So, um, so I was able to do that. And it was a, you know, a flurry of activity to prove myself and a ball was in that, uh, the fabulous Cliff Simon, oh, who, you know, we yeah. lost this May year. May he rest in peace. Yeah. I his, mean, he was a His outfits. Human. You want to, you want to talk about someone who could wear clothes, man. Yes. Could that man wear clothes? Holy he cow. really could. And not only because he was a, a an athlete, you know, but he he took such pride in his character as well. And, he had a you know, we have a saying in the a saying in the business, you know, do the clothes wear? does he wear the clothes or do the clothes wear him? And so some people put on something and it's schlumpy. Right. And they don't do justice to your to your costume. But the majority of people consider costume to be a representation of their character that they've worked on you know, with the director and the producers and the story writers and themselves. And then we're the final, the final layer that they put on that helps the viewer understand, you know? So Cliff Simon to me was, was one of the great ones, you know, he just really embraced that. There were the, the materials that were used for him were just extraordinary. Did you design his outfit in the quest? Yes. Because yeah. I think that it's interesting that we're starting with the quest because I, I think that that would have to be my favorite. That material, okay. that, that um, synth, I don't know what you want to call it, but it was almost like this, that it, I didn't want to think it would be a, like a leather, this black with the, with the, yeah. with the belt and everything was yeah. just perfect. And the collars, man, that man, that man looks good. <laughs> But we were so lucky to have like a model shop that built buckles for us yeah. and, you know, built like so much stuff for us that we could add to costumes. But yeah, his was just like perfection. He was always elegant, even though he was, you know, the bad guy's got to look good, right? Bad guy's <laughs> got to look good. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to segue into what is going to be a, a pretty uh, core part of this, which is it's a military show. You know, and there are going to be uh, uh, there, there is Air Force input, you know, for for the Air Force characters and everything else. Chris uh, De La Garza um, said, I don't have a question, but just please tell this wonderful lady as an army veteran. I look for all the mistakes on the military uniforms and I never found one. And that makes me so happy and proud. That means so much to us because um, it was such a big part of the SG-1 story and we were so lucky to be allowed to use authentic Air Force uniforms, but we did have a lot of eyes on us as well. And, you know, um, as you know, a few of the um, the Joint Chief Staffs, Generals That's... came onto the show. They brought their own uniforms, which was great. Um, <laughs> but we had people... Um, IMS was our rental, our rental company, and we they had people that would literally do the historical research on where that unif where that person was based on their age, what campaigns they were on, how many medals they should have garnered, and they would do that. We we didn't touch that because we wow. were were costume people. We went to military experts, and of course, we always had in my day on SG One, we had a fellow named Doug Thar. He was our film liaison and he was actually at the Pentagon and we had, I wanted to tell a funny story because one day we were on set and we had the joint chief of staff meeting. And so they're in this huge boardroom, you know, and um, <clears throat> William Devane was there as the president and everybody is just looking so impressive from every, every uh, arm of the military. So this is continuum we're talking about. Yeah. And they, they called me and said, 
Val, it's 100 degrees in here. I was in my office, not on set. And they said, can we take their jackets off? And I said, uh, I've never asked that question. So I picked up the phone and called Doug Starr at the Pentagon. I was like, I'm calling, you know, I mean, I was a little bit flabbergasted by the power of Stargate. Yeah. And I said, and Doug picked up and I said, can they ever take their jackets off? And he said, only if they ask the president and he gives permission. And I said, okay, so then tell Brad and Brad and Robert and Paul and Joe and Carl, and they write a line. Yeah, because William Devane is the, as the president is there. Yes, and he gave them permission. And then it was up to us to situate them on the chair so we could still see all the ribbon boards and the still make it look so impressive, right? And I was like, who gets to call the Pentagon? You know, what? during their work day. <laughs> I was in awe of the show I was on, right? Those are the things that make the show absolutely authentic because mm -hmm. the commander in chief is the only one who can give them permission to take their jackets off. That's that is perfect. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, did you ever feel confined by the military aspects uh, of it? To be frank, that your heroes uh, were uh, wearing costumes that had to be a certain way that mm -hmm. you couldn't you know you couldn't do these are your leads you know you want to gussy them up the guys and the girls you know yeah. yeah i mean sometimes you you wish for a more creative you know venture but we tried to get them on on earth every once in a while to put them into civilian clothes and uh there was always interesting aliens and off-world civilizations to take up our our um, our energy. But I I agree. I mean, sometimes it was just you know, well, let's make sure it's right, and and you don't want to get lackadaisical about it because you've seen it, right? right? So that was actually kept us on our toes. And then the the writing team would come up with with creative solutions to that because these people did have lives. I remember the opening to Family Ties. Uh, the episode which which uh, featured Fred Willard uh, has uh, Sam and Vala returning from Victoria's Secret in a day of pedicures and you know massages oh, and heaven knows that. what else. And they've got the they they've got their civvies on and they look like dynamite. Yeah, yeah. Well, all girls when they're shopping are happy, right? <laughs> so uh, that was really really a fun show to do. And Fred Willard, what an yeah. amazing you know comedy actor he was he was fun to do as well because we did him sort of you know um tommy bahama-ish you know like he had a like he had an airstream a little bit you know <laughs> crazy character yeah how did you keep your head above water for the 200th episode tell us about 200 what a what a crazy experience i've talked with so many people about this Christopher Judge was the one who said that, you know, we produced, they produced so much so fast. They knew that they, you guys knew that it was coming. Yeah. So you had, yeah. you had a little bit of warning, a little but bit. there was like, according to Chris's experience from what he saw, no one complained. Everyone was, knew that what they were doing was only because the fans demanded that the show be as long as it on as be on as long as it was. Yeah. I think that, that, you know, we all felt like it was an honor, you know, I mean, nobody ever wants it to end when it's such a great family, but I think we had a little bit of warning, not too much. Um, and I think that everybody just put their head down and said, we're not going to let up now. And, you know, I have an incredible team on that show of like 20 sewers and, you know, five people doing breakdown. And I mean, it was just all hands on deck, full throttle. Did you expect and, to be doing Wizard of Oz and all these other kinds of crazy things? I mean, isn't that amazing that you yeah. can, like that is the fantasy world and sci-fi, the beauty of sci-fi to me is there's no limit to your imagination, right? And that includes our writers. You know, from a costume to, um, aspect, of course, but um, definitely the writers just let it fly, right? What is it um, like? Have you have you seen some of these episodes since? Have you looked back on them? Some of them. Okay. Some of them, I have to say, I'm I'm. You know, sometimes I'll see an actor um, in something, and I'll think, oh, I remember designing for them. 
Right. You know, and so maybe you'll go back and look at something. I have a lot of photos as well. I have like 5,000 wow. photos. So sometimes wow. I look at like fitting photos and the progression of the of the costume. I mean, I have to tell you, this is a little bit off of the SG1, so you might yeah. want to. No, it's um, fine. But probably one of my greatest moments in my career was <clears throat> Jason Momoa called me, you know, so I'm working on Stargate Universe and said, Val, can I take some of my stuff? Cause I'm going on game of Thrones and I want to show them what I like and how to do it. And I, of course, couldn't give them anything. I did ask and they were like, no. <laughs> um, but I just felt like we had done a good job when the actor says, I want to show them what we've done. Wow. And he wanted to use Ronan as his template for Khal Drogo, you yeah. know, and he did a Hakka for that. I mean, I, I have to wonder how much of Drogo had Ronan Dex inside of him. You know, well, there because, was some there. Um, I mean, Jason was very collaborative. He was very involved in, in the costumes. He loves costumes so much. So I imagine he had some input and he took some from his, from his history. What was it like designing for Ronan Dex? I mean, these, these coats that he had, these leather, I mean, this guy was was well to put it on, specifically on the run, you know, yeah. and he it was yeah. completely utilitarian costume. He was I, I had so much fun with Jason designing for him because he's I mean he's a big man. He's six foot five. He's not a tall skinny guy. He can handle anything. As a matter of fact, it takes a little adjusting to get used to the fact that everything has to be a little larger than life for him right? Because things will, will be lost on him. And when I first um, was asked to go on to Stargate Atlantis, I went into that meeting, you know, and it was like, obviously, Brad and Robert, but it was also Joe and Paul and Carl Binder. And they were like in this sort of creative, uh, creative meeting, like, you know, we want you to come on, but what are you going to bring? Right. Kind of thing. And so I came with two ideas. The first thing was I thought that all of our lead cast should have an off-world outfit because we had, because as you said about SG-1, when they were always in the military uniform, you know, we wanted to create some levels of interest. And this is and, seasons four and five, again, to, be, to clarify. Yeah, seasons four and five on Stargate Atlantis. And so I had come in with some ideas for each of them, including Rodney McKay, you know, like he needed to be sexy and he needed to, you know, have some attitude. And, and of course, you know, um, Shepard, uh, John Shepard and all that. I wanted him to look, you know, like really like seriously badass and, and stuff. But I, the challenge with him was always, uh, he was always wearing a, a flak vest. So you couldn't put a lot of detail that wasn't going to be seen. You had to work with, you know, all the departments on that. And, uh, but of course, Taylor, you know, Rachel Aww. and all that. I mean, she was a queen and I just felt like this creative juice is welling up in me wanting to do stuff for her. And then of course, so Ronan Dex and they were like, well, what would you do with him? And I was like, well, you know, he gathers things cause he is a warrior and he's on the run. And so we built this coat that we called the cow um, <laughs> because I've got, <laughs> it, well, for one, it was so heavy. It took, it weighed about 25 pounds, but he just would throw it on and walk around in it all day. But, um, we built it with like findings, like pieces of metal and, and pelts and, and, you know, different leathers. And, but I tell you, it was about six feet long, that coat, you know, it was a labor of love for sure. Labor of love with our, with our team constructing it and then he would come in and try it on because he was getting so excited <laughs> do is it a part of their their contracts that they be made available the actors be made available to you to x y or z extent in order to get the feel of it uh, and the the look of it right and to get them because obviously they have to wear the wardrobe before they you know in pre-production before they go on um yeah. but uh where where is is the line there because it sounds like jason was one of the ones who were more like gung ho about it. And so I guess not all the actors are. It's like, all right, let's let's try it. Okay, it fits. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> there was a few of those. And that <laughs> you're just trying to get them in so they don't put it on later and go, oh, it doesn't fit. Yeah. Shouldn't have exactly. had that burrito yeah. last night, Val, let me tell you. <laughs> and then they also, you've just made six of them, right? Because everything true. had to be multiples because they were stunted and they were, you know, wearing them all the time. And 
you know, that was always on those shows. You have to prepare for all that. And so we did have a couple of people that were less than um, enthusiastic about costume fittings, but I would, I would always read like the call sheet and that and like, oh, they have this scene off, you know, and I would go and warn them, like come in then and we would be ready for them. So it was about accommodating their schedule to a certain degree and them accommodating ours. For I'm pretty bossy. Yeah. <laughs> for Atlantis, you went in a different direction. You 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 got you lost the triangles and you went with stripes and room in the back. It, that actually made line a line of dialogue in season four because they could now do this. <laughs> well, that was one of my one of my pitches. That was the second pitch that I had was, you know, I think that we can just make the uniforms a little sexier. Right. That was, that's kind of, I would say that's a bit of my reputation. I, I hope is that things, you know, look sexy and, um, you know, textural. Uh, so I, that was my second pitch to our, to our creators and showrunners was that I thought that we could, we could make those work a little bit, a little more subtle on the color coding and things. So we did redesign for the lead cast, our, our um, uniforms and, you know, make the pants fit the girls really well. And mm -hmm. there's little, you know and stuff like that so I thought that was great I thought they turned out really well and then we still had the other uniforms represented it was it was a nice blend transition one of my favorite costumes that you did was and we see it for one scene and she's sitting is be all my sins remembered the the surprise ending where Tori Higginson appears and you gave her this so it's it's her, but it's not her. You gave her this kind of like really, really burnt orange, like a oh. dark orange leather jacket. Yeah. And yeah. it was like if 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 a copy of Weir had been able to create like her own thing, it was like a skew from Atlantis. It was one of the coolest outfits for Aww. maybe the single the single coolest surprise reveal that Atlantis gave us. The coolest. And and, it, and just on camera that long, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when doing something, because I mean, I didn't work with Tori. She was, she had gone from the mm -hmm. show when I arrived, but to have this sort of, you know, she was iconic at the start of Atlanta. So I wanted to do her, you know, proud. And to just take some of that um, character that she represented and then make it more, you know, civilian modern. Yeah. Kind of thing. So she's still tough. She was this, you know, a power. Absolutely. Hedge sure. leather, you know, tough. And, <laughs> and stuff. So I'm a big fan of leather. It tells a lot of stories. I was about to ask your favorite material. So leather's at the top? I would say so because it it's malleable. It fits you and yet it, it fits to you. It also can be painted. It can be sanded. And all those things that we did to our costumes, nothing ever came off the assembly line and went on camera. It had to go through all of these different levels of, of processing for it to look real, mm. you know? So, so everything we touched with, with a little bit of painters or, or sanding or something. I have always loved leather because of, it, for all those reasons, but additionally, there's a sound factor to a lot of these clothes. If, if the microphone is sensitive enough, it will pick certain things up when leather moves. Mm -hmm. You know, especially like if you're like, there's there's a sound to it that feels, I don't know even know how to describe it, but there's just, there is, there is that aesthetic as well, that dimension to it that you wouldn't normally expect. It's funny that you brought that up because I know when I did the Lucian Alliance, the sound guys were, were ready to commit Harry Carey uh, <laughs> because sometimes leather <laughs> can make a sound. <laughs> I think it sounds natural. That's why it almost breathes, right? And I love that about leather. Um, but uh, when you use too much and you do Velcro with it to get it on and off. Oh, it, no. <laughs> so that's my line now. If a sound guy says, oh, I don't like that cotton shirt, I go, well, it could be leather with Velcro. So be happy with the cotton. <laughs> so I learned that on Stargate as well. <laughs> it's those things that you don't really anticipate that are like not uh, remotely inside of your uh, of of your uh, wheelhouse of responsibilities that that I would at least I would think what is this thing going to sound like to the guys who are later going to have to clean it up you know mm -hmm. wow 
And I think about, you know, it's funny, as you get more seasoned, let's just say, the things that you learn, like to just take all that with you, um, even when I was on set and hearing a sound person or a camera person say, well, that reflects or a sound person say that's too noisy. I tried to bring all that when I became a costume designer. And so now the camera is, is really one of my most important um, considerations, right? And, I, and so when you're doing leather, you've got to be careful you know, that there's no reflection, there's no, you know, things like that. And I'm sort of known more for texture. I like things, I like the camera to like it. I like it to have depth and, and color, hence layers of breakdown and sanding. And it gives matte and shine, you know, things like that are always a consideration for me. Has HD been a blessing or a curse? Has it been both? Both. Yeah. Both, yeah. You just have to learn it. Um, you know, people say, oh, it's the stripes. And I think, yeah, but that's just one aspect of the, of the problem or the consideration, right, is, is patterns. Um, probably more of a problem for makeup than- <laughs> That's a completely separate, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> that was a headache. Um, but I think, I think it's actually shown when you do quality work, it's your friend. So if you're going to be honest and truthful, into the into the circumstances to bring all of your all of yeah. all of the quality to bear it's going to show exactly so it was our friend let's say with the team i had yeah <laughs> true artisan uh george marsak uh went above and beyond in, in creating uh, a list of questions for you i'm going to try to keep it pretty uh succinct uh here um are there any we're just tapping at this at the surface on this Val. Are there any common design mistakes in that you see trending in your industry that you try to avoid? I I feel they're um, design mistakes in fabrics. I'm I'm disappointed in the quality of product that's out there and the fact that costume designers accept that. That they don't push for a superior product. Yeah, or they don't create one, you know. Wow. Can you elaborate? I just feel like there's, you know, that fast fashion kind of a look is very easy to throw on people, but you're not using, <clears throat> how can I say this? It, it doesn't show well. It doesn't show on camera. It has no depth. It has no interest. It's just a piece of fabric. So for me, I'm always trying to find something either vintage or quality. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's an interesting perspective. I, and I know a lot of this would have to do with opinion and experience and everything else, but mm -hmm. there has to be um uh when you're when you're watching these different programs, you're you're looking for those kinds of things because you know what those fabrics are. But also mm -hmm. I think even for those who are uninitiated, there's a feeling that we get when we're watching uh, a program if to some if something is truthful or not and we may not have necessarily the vocabulary to express it but exactly. we especially with historical stuff we have family histories and we've seen a lot of these clothes and something may ring true or false i think that's what it does it just rings false and you don't quite know why yeah. you know if you don't have the but that will stop me from enjoying a show wow that makes right? a lot of sense. He also yeah. wanted to know what tools uh, do you commonly use and how have these tools perhaps changed over the recent years with the developments in technology? What's become easier? What's become less time consuming? What's become more time consuming and been worth it? I would say that, you know, that's such a different set of tools that you use on Stargate than you use on a contemporary show. Okay or a period show. I would say that the tools that I used translated better from Stargate to the period show that I just did because it was about um, resourcing, making things look authentic, attention to detail, quality. Whereas when you're, sometimes when you're doing a civilian uh, um, show, you're trying to get you know a modern suit on somebody. It's not really the same tools that I use to define a period or define a character. If that makes sense. It does. No, there is, there's, there's so much that goes into it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's only so much time that you have to, to create a lot of this stuff. So I'm sure it's mm -hmm. like, how much time do I have to get this exactly right? Did you ever feel like, you know, 
and I'm, I'm sure this hasn't happened because I'm sure, you know, you made sure to, to get the work done. But did anything ever go to print on Stargate where it was like, you know what? I wish I really had another pass at that piece. Or it's like, you know, for what they were asking for, this piece was just a compromise. There was no other option for what for what it had to bring out in terms of utility on set and what they had to do with it. You know, this this was one that was just like a Frankenstein. I would say there's only one that I can think of, and it might be for different reasons than than you've listed, is that when we were doing the Lucian Alliance, yes. Brad had said to me, Brad Wright, I want them to look really sort of utilitarian, Val, like really like they're the SWAT team in space. And of course, I can't help myself sometimes. I design something. And um, so I built all the padding inside the outfit. So it was smooth on the outside, but I actually bought some mannequins and we cut the front off and we covered them in leather. So it was like a, a piece of armor, but it was, and so I wanted the whole army to have the same abs, right? <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what you were, you put on this breastplate and oh, you look like Cliff Simon. Um, <laughs> it's a good model. Up. It's a good model. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people embrace that, let me tell you. Um, and then we did a fitting with our first um, guest uh, player. I'm sorry, I can't, can't remember his name. And we took him up to Brad and he just went, no, it's not what I want. It's too designed. And I was like, okay. So I literally, I, I haven't told many people this story and certainly not on such a large audience, but I'm, I'm confessing here. Um, I sent my whole team home at three in the afternoon and said, stop everything. Cause we had an assembly line going, we were making 30 of these, 40 of these. And he had just said, I don't like it. Yeah. And so, um, and Brad is a very nice person. I'm sure that, you know, I went up, sent them home and I went up and talked to him. I sat on his couch and said, okay, you know, what are you looking for? What are we missing and what? And then I stayed there that night and I remember being like the only one on the lot and working on a mannequin and taking it apart and trying not to like completely fall apart really because it was devastating yeah. to me. Brad was not happy because I, that was my goal. Yeah. And um and then I came up with an idea and we kind of stripped it down and I went to him the next morning and I showed him and we put it on somebody and he said, you know, I can live with that. That makes sense to me. You know, like now it makes sense. So we actually, in fact, when the, at the start of um, the episode, we had them in the breastplates on the spaceship. And then when they landed, they went into the other one. So we didn't completely waste everything because it's all budgetary as well. So you, know, you were shooting at that point. Budget. We were shooting, uh, I think this was on a Thursday, we were shooting Monday. Oh my gosh. So you were busting your butt. Yeah. This wasn't, was, this wasn't weeks of pre-production time that we're talking about here. No, we were in the final stages. We were pretty far along as well. We committed a lot of a lot of money and a lot of time. And so I had to find a way to sort of use what we had and build new ones and you know, and then go to them and pitch that, you know. So I would say when it went on camera, I was <clears throat> nervous beyond beyond anything. And then when we saw them together, we broke them down a yeah. lot more and stuff. Brad said, no, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. But I have a, had a funny feeling that was his least favorite thing I ever did. And that always stuck with me, right? You want your executive producer to be happy, you know. But and you, creator. <laughs> you go, right, exactly. And you want to... No, that's that's certainly true. And you want yeah. but also you I mean there has to be a balance between uh what the the creative wants and you as a creative person need yeah. to fulfill as well because yeah. you can create XYZ in space. That doesn't yeah. necess I mean at a certain point I suppose you have to say okay this is this is a space creature or X, Y, or Z, and it's not on Earth, and I've just got to trust that this is what they want. I'm not going to be able to have my way every single time. Not that you, it's your way against theirs, but sometimes it is. Like in this, you know, you had you had a look, and it wasn't what he wanted. Yeah. But then I had to fight for aspects of it and yeah. explain why I did it. And then he was like, okay, now I understand your thinking. So maybe – so, and he, they were very collaborative – um, they, because I once went into a meeting, you know, with bolts of fabric and, you know, this is what I'm going to do and showing them sketches. And they would always be like, Paul Molly looked at me and said, Val, do what you do. Like, I just thought that was the, the nicest compliment anybody had said to me, you know, I'd ask my questions about, you know, 
is he in jeopardy? Is he stunted? And all had gone through the whole script. And he said, you do what you do. And that made me feel like they trusted me. And that's what, you know, that's where you ideally want to get. And that's what happens on a, in a family, right? When you're with people for years and you prove yourself to each other. Mm. That's why it was such a great franchise to be a part of. The, um, the Lucian Alliance uniforms and, and so much of that, there was a lot of leather on that destiny, on that ancient ship. The um, uh, Gunny Orbe wanted to know, how different was it designing uniforms for the Lucians as opposed to the more uh, familiar military uniforms? So I guess I guess that, that basically answers that. Mike Dopood, God bless him. You know, you had worked uh, with him on all three shows. He had yeah. started off as just a bounty hunter in SG-1. Then yeah. he was a child protector in yeah. Atlantis as as Kirik. So he went from Odai Ventrell to Kirik and then finally to Varro. Varro. And, and in so many respects, uh, you could, it could, it's not that his, his performance is a single note, but they were clearly picking an actor who had that... I'm tough on the outside, but I'm really gushy and mushy on the inside, you know, yeah. where you could just like saddle up next to him and get and get to know this character for a little bit. And after a, after a while, be like, man, I totally get you. Yeah, he he's an amazing actor. You know, he's he's really a great guy. But he like you say, I mean, he was three different sort of characters. Mm. You know, he was in three different costumes and three different names, but he really did play a lot of the same heart on the outside. He was always that missionary, you know, kind of warrior kind of feel to him. And that's and he's a and he's a strong guy. So he was always so fun to design for. What is would you say, um, Philip Schwartz, your your single greatest costume feat, or a couple of them from the entire Stargate franchise, when you really look back at that and say, you know what? That was a great piece. I did good. Okay. I have a couple, actually. I've, I've thought of it. I'm going to start with Stargate Universe and, and Dr. Rush, who was um, wearing, who was a professor, right? Right. And, you know, Bobby was coming from Scotland, so a lot of our preliminary, um, you know, conversations were not in person. And so we were quite far ahead on his on his costume when he when he arrived. And we made some subtle changes, but what I had decided was we didn't want to do the the um, predictable. You know, he's a great actor. He also is kind of a wiry guy, so you couldn't dress him like you would Michael Shanks, right? He's right. just a different. And he's a smaller guy too. He is, and he can be a little bit overwhelmed if yeah. you don't understand that so i did quite a bit of sort of research on that and when he arrived you know so i didn't want to have him in a tweed jacket and you know a blue shirt <laughs> the, the stereotypical was, professor exactly and they were going to be stranded yeah. possibly for five to ten years with the stargate you yeah. know record and and uh history so i thought we've got to have 30 of these or 40 of these in yeah. his closet right because he's going to go through levels of breakdown and jeopardy and stunting and all that so this is the, a wonder basically it's a wonder these costumes had to be just perfect for the character so um i actually decided to make him a brown it's called new buck it's sort of a cross between suede and leather and I found this great fabric and i had you know great talent on our on our team and they made him a blazer but it wasn't yes. cheesy. It wasn't that kind of, you know, cheesy leather thing. So that had some depth and, and it would have looked great on camera. And plus it wasn't black, it was brown. And then I made him a vest. And because of Robert's stature, it was sort of a small check, right? But it was that kind of British feel to it. That was my ode to the professor. <laughs> professor. And, uh, and he ended up wearing a white waffle underneath, which we thought that was his idea. And it was such a great oh, idea. Okay instead of a college shirt. So I made this vest and I was like, how can I make this different and unique and worthy of Stargate, right? Worthy of our work that we had done. And so I was at a fabric store one day where I spent a lot of my time and um, I found this beautiful silk and it, I just saw part of it. It kind of looked like a moonscape, right? And I thought, but then it was, it was like a peacock, but part of it looked like a planet. And I thought, oh, and so I grabbed it and I, and I reserved a whole bunch of it. I took it back to my cutter and I said, I want to make this into the lining of the vest, but cause he's always putting a pencil and a pad that was part of his character that they were building. 
So I thought if I can talk him into using the vest rather than the jacket, we can make this, you know, something great. So we ended up building this by piecing together this silk into a moonscape. And then when Bobby came for the fitting, I said, this is my thought. And he was like, okay, I like it. He came the next day for another fitting. He said, I've been thinking about it. I want like a real pencil. I want a real pad. Cause yeah. I want to always be doing that. Always be doing that Val. Yeah. And the so actors want business, you know, yeah. they want to, they want to be able to keep themselves busy. Yeah. And so that was actually one of my proudest costumes I've ever built. Wow. That's yeah, that's great. one of my favorites. Um, I have to say that, you know, definitely Ball was a joy to work with because of the elegance of the person and the right. elegance of the character. And you could use rich brocades. And he always swept into a room, you know, <laughs> so you can have the taller true. and the, you know, I mean, and we all stole a little bit from Matrix, you know, right. <laughs> that kind of feeling. And, um, you know, Adria was just a joy because she had the fire, right? Her eyes right. would light up. So we did one dress for her that was all velvet chiffon. And when the when she walked, the dress had like 10 layers of chiffon, but it was like yellow, orange, red, gold. And so it looked like flames when she moved in it, right? And so it was always trying to represent the character in a costume way. And because it was sci-fi, you could go a little bit more over the top. You could, not as subtle, right? I mean, I made her a dress where when she lifted her arm, it looked like a galaxy. The lace detail was wow. just something. That was kind of a happy circum a happy mistake actually. But when <laughs> we got it on and we're like, wait a minute, that looks amazing. So um, definitely Ronan, definitely, and Kayla. I mean, she, when she was pregnant. Yeah, that's a whole separate thing. Oh my God. I mean, I was making her probably f averaging about four costumes in an episode as she, and sometimes in an episode, she would change size. Right. right? Caden's getting big. <laughs> and that was a, but she's so lovely. Yeah. You know, Rachel's so lovely. She worked with, with us so much. And, and that was also another creative learning experience, like how to make that not just a big old bump, you know, how to make her look regal and queen like, and you know, I, that was really amazing working when, with her. When yeah. I, if I would be an actor, you mm -hmm. guys would, for a couple of reasons, you know, I want to look good and I want to, you know, make friends with everybody, but you guys would be some of my best friends because I want to be as comfortable as possible on those yeah. long days. And the more that we're in each other's heads, the more mm -hmm. we can get, you know, I, I, it's not so much like a selfish perspective, but it kind of is, you know, I want them to spend as much time as they can on my stuff so that, you know, it's going to fit right. And not to say that you wouldn't on some of the others, but it's like, I want them to really pour the love into what they're doing for what, for what I'm going to wear, because I want to wear it as proudly as I can and as comfortably as I can, for instance, for Rachel. Yeah, because I think. It is, you know, through my my learning wisdom from working with people, working with actors, working with stunt people, it is a consideration. You know, we're filming this in July in a studio. Should she be able to get that off when they yell cut? And should she have a tank top underneath to be comfortable? So then she welcomes putting it on again right. rather than dreading it like you're like you're describing. Yeah. So, you know, for Rachel, it was about comfort because she was really pregnant, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, this was like, it's hard to get up in the morning and work a 14 hour day, you know? Mm -hmm. so what can we do to help her? So you're right. She was a, she was a real consideration. That was a consideration in her designs. And then look at an episode like The Queen, where you're mm -hmm. putting her into a full Wraith get up for yeah. hours on end. She's yeah. just had a baby, you know, yeah. she's doing post baby things, you know, yeah. that she's having to yeah. deal with. And she's, she's spoken on this show about that, you know. Um, <laughs> that, that's a situation where I don't know if comfort fact can factor in so much as it's got to look perfect for this role. Well, what we did with her in that, cause she was uh, nursing. And so that exactly. was a, you know, um, and, and male or female costume designer, this is, a, this is something you have to deal with sometimes as somebody who's just had a baby. Um, and so by layering her, we were able to give her access to what she needed to right. do.
by also just getting her into a comfort layer, like it meaning that the the layer that was next to her skin, excuse me, um, uh -huh. the layer that was next to her skin was really comfortable. And so once she took off the top two layers, she could go to her room and do what and she had to do and, and be like in normal clothes, basically. And then we layered her up with all the layers of leather and netting and all those things. I and mean, we won we won awards for that show. That was that was uh, uh, amazing and had to have, you know, the Wraith Queen and her and it was it was fantastic. Yeah, the the one time that we saw a female, I believe, other than Andy Frizzell, was that yeah. primary and what a face that she had. When that costume and that makeup come together, oh man. Yeah. I mean, the Wraith are just were amazing and Christina McQuarrie did such an amazing job of the of the original costumes. I mean, you just couldn't you couldn't improve on that, right? And Christopher Heyerdahl. You know, oh. I mean, God. I I would imagine Todd's look was pretty established the year before you came in. It you was know? actually, we did not want to touch it. He was perfect. She had done such a great job. And he was, to me, really the lead rate. He was, you know, but when Michael started to change a little bit, Connor Trenier, that's when I took the opportunity to to use some brown and, and change a little bit on it. Well, you, you I, I would think that you would take a look at what the script is saying and what the character's progressions are. And in his case, he's literally evolving into something else. Yeah. So why not take an opportunity to have the costume flow with that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And going brown rather than black made it easier. Like you're always thinking about the viewer as well. You know, the fans. I want to help them follow the story. Right. So that helps them see that he is becoming quite different. In a situation like Universe, where you have a very down-to-earth character like Eli, mm -hmm. for instance, did you have anything to do with the You Are Here shirt? Oh, Robert Cooper, 100%. 100%. <laughs> no, we were looking at all sorts of shirts and he came down one day and said, I think this is the one. And we were like, oh, well, then that's the one. And it was perfect. It, you know, he had just found it. So why would you, why would you argue that? Well, the only thing I would argue is, okay, can you get me a hundred more of them? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, Aren't you're going to kind of. I know. Yeah. You're we gonna... bought it online. I mean, it's not available. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. In, yeah. in those kinds of situations, it's kind of like, well, there's only so much room I can design on this. You know, Eli is Eli. And if that's what Rob wants, then that's what we're going to do, you know? There's, there's, I, I imagine there are just certain situations like with those kinds of characters who are more or less off the street. Yeah. And these are the clothes that were on their back when they came through that wormhole. Yeah. And that was the, that was the challenge and the great thing about universe. Like whenever I talk about Stargate, the franchise, each one of them was so uniquely different to me, you know, uh, and I'm sure for obviously for, for everybody, but universe was everyday people as well as military being stranded on a ship with with no way back in there you know is the initial thought and i thought we need to get i always think of the whole group together in a in a in a scene like you don't think about just the one character you think about ming na standing beside david blue standing beside you know lou diamond phillips and how do we get that interest and show the diversity of this group stranded on this ship right mm -hmm. all their own so, different backgrounds and all their own different professions all kind of feed into that like ming for instance ming was a politician for all yeah. intents and purposes she must yeah. have been just a delight Oh, I loved her. Yeah, she was she was really great. And and um, you know, to get her in that perfect politician suit, right? Right. <laughs> right, but still comfortable. Right. Not fussy. You know, like it had to be, you know, she wears that burgundy sweater and it was like, well, why this? Why not a Chris shirt? You know, well, and so we talked a lot about it. And they're sort of saying, can I wear this for five years, Val? Like right. there, there's much conversation that goes on when you're starting in a series and and looking at the, the longevity of it. I, I imagine, you know, especially with Universe, it was what they had on their back when they evacuated. And part of me would be as a as a as a viewer would be like, why are they wearing this? Yeah. And a lot of the answers would be because it was Tuesday at Icarus Base, and this is what they wore on Tuesdays. And that's when the attack happened. You that's know? right. That's right. You know? And I loved Universe because because it was Icarus Base, we got to build those those uniforms. Yes. You know? 
with the nameplate for all the for all the body swapping. Yeah, you had to keep yeah. it straight. I know it was a bit of a, you know, a mind bender, but, you know, just to be able to make them t-shirts, like we use bamboo and they were just so comfortable. The girls got to have a little bit of a V-neck. They didn't look like they were wearing their brother's outfit. You know, like the military is sort of known for being a bit uniform uh, in size, right? <laughs> and uh, they're not a built. <laughs> just makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, so we got to really build those. And that was, uh, for one, we could have a never ending supply, which right. was a bonus. And we could have different levels, the amount of the amount of jeopardy they went through, the amount of dust and rust and everything that accumulated. And then we do a flashback and here'd be their original one. You know, like we have closets full of them, right? So that was, that was a really, it was great to have that control. I loved your designs for the Novens in late season two of SGU, the culture mm -hmm. that is created as a result of a time travel quirk, an accident, spawns mm -hmm. this whole civilization of people that have evolved for 2000 years in mm -hmm. this distant galaxy of humans. And mm -hmm. they looked great. Talk about uh, a, 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 a chance to, to make a, a hard 90 degree turn into something that could plausibly be us, but still yeah. not be. Yeah. It, you know, that's the sort of thing that's such a discussion in the concept meeting and in my initial, like in my costume meetings is this is where I think we're going. Does this work for, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Carl or whoever wrote the script and, and show running and, you know, because that's such a big commitment mm. when you start down that path. And it just kept evolving. The wonderful thing about working on Stargate with that family of uh, producers was they would give you a heads up, mm -hmm. you know, in their concept meetings, they'd be like, and so maybe a month ahead, you'd be like, okay, start thinking about this now. Yeah, they don't the want you to be hit by the bus. You couldn't, it was, it would be yeah. physically almost impossible to create some of those civilizations in a seven day turnaround that we had. Right. Especially I mean, so, if, you know, we're going to be using them over several episodes. This is not a one-off, for instance, like the Novans. That's right. That's right. You know, so, so that kind of stuff was really interesting. And the, the breakdown was so important with those guys, right? Wow. Because like the rusting of them and, and that it was to me, and also to show up against the location. Like that's the other thing. Where are we going to be? What does this planet look like? You know, is it is it clay? Is it rock? Is it you know? Is it the hoodoos? Is it grass? Is it whatever? Those were always such important discussions. One, Stargate taught me a lot, a lot of questions to ask in a meeting, right? And it it makes sense where you know if you're going to a desert planet, you're going to have desert camo with the, with the military because mm -hmm. a your tax dollar at work and b yeah. you know this this makes functional sense. But if you look at air and the juxtaposition of where they were when they start and where they end up in New Mexico at White Sands, you've oh. got these soldiers in black, you know? And it's clearly the juxtaposition of, this is what we were expecting, this is the reality that we've been thrown into. So yeah. here against <laughs> the white quartz sands of New Mexico, we are wearing black. And not only are we wearing black, we're gonna be wearing black for five seasons at least. For sure. It was like, those are the things that, I don't know. I mean, it's a huge breakdown opportunity, meaning that, you know, to show the dust and everything and, and to show, you know, that's always so great. Um, the black in the desert wasn't great for heat. Um, you know, there's a reason they wear light colors. Right. Um, <laughs> it is practical. Um, but man, you know, Ro uh, Robert Nepper is Simeon in, in there, that you too. know. Yeah, season two. Bad fight and, the Misty you know, Badlands. All, yeah, yeah. Like all, the, I loved going on those locations because they gave us such an opportunity, opportunity to do something unique again. Right? I, uh, Ivan uh, Telen, Ivan Telenchev, uh, why was the North Face brand used in SGA? Any specific reason? Now, I know that uh, production used North Face a great deal. And there are very mm -hmm. few product placements actually inside of the show. When yeah. Atlanta started, the North Face was one of them. Yeah, that would have been Christina. And okay. it would have been a, um, a decision 
to, and they would have gone for product placement. So it could have been budgetary. It could have been exposure. It was the perfect thing for that, for the, for the storyline. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of really worked. You know, I thought it was a great choice. Um, we spend a lot of our time not using labels. Mm -hmm. So it's always interesting to see, to see a, a logo on something. But um, she obviously made that choice based on, um, you know, availability and, and product placement and, right and stuff. yeah and i mean production was using it constantly everyone wore north face up in vancouver i always thought it was funny though that i mean you have you have in the southernmost place on the earth you have daniel jackson wearing a north face outfit <laughs> why is it there a south face <laughs> right exactly this is antarctica <laughs> that was funny uh eli barker this is an anomaly um but i only, I mean, th these little things come up. What were in all the pockets on all the military vests? Could oh, have been so Fifth Avenue candy bars. That is so funny. They actually, I mean, that is a props question, but I do know the answer. Um, they had like little, um, almost like, uh, you know, when you get a sander and you have that block that okay. you wrap around, they'd be like, not wooden blocks, because that would have been too heavy, not styrofoam. It was something that they, that had a uh, definite form. Right, to provide that could a look because they wanted consistency all the time. Wow! All right, Melissa Smith. Uh, could how we spoke about the cow <laughs> for Ronan? <laughs> yeah. So, could you tell ahead of time if a costume would need to be um, particularly heavy, and how do you decide what a costume needs um, to be made from? I know she says, I know the gentleman that plays Braytac, Tony Amendola mentioned they kept his as a, a heavy material throughout the series. And, and Tony always thought it was quite challenging to wear. Yeah. I didn't, Joppas I, are something completely different. Yeah, they are. And I would say I'll answer it um, relating to Jason. Um, we had some costumes that he brought me this, this vest. He would go um, vintage shopping on the weekend in LA and he would come back <laughs> all enthused and say, Val, I want to wear this on the show. And I'd be great. We just need four of them. And it'd be something from World War One, right? So it'd be yeah. like the wrong color and the wrong. So I would say, but then we would, we would talk about how we could make it work for the show. And so on this one episode, he had to go into fighting mode. He was just like walking along the planet and he had to go into fighting mode. So I took this vintage World War I vest that he brought me and we replicated it ex on the exterior and we made panels that came off and underneath were all of his knives. Right. So that was a heavy, then we had a cheat one that he could right. wear most of the time. And then there was the action one, stunt yeah. one, but he loved the idea of that hidden kind of ninja thing where he just went, foo, foo, and then all of his knives were revealed. So that was <laughs> quite heavy. <laughs> and so that's just reading the script and knowing his character and what he can handle. And because he's such a warrior in his heart, he was game for all of that stuff, you know? So you have to make sure that you're in a situation where you're not going to throw something in an actor that they're physically not going to be prepared for. You know, yeah. I can imagine that that would be something that would chase you in your sleep. You know, yeah. I, like what kind of nightmares does each of these department heads have? That would be one where it's like anything that that prevents the the actor from fulfilling their potential on air would be a big one. Big one. And I think, you know, I mean, a series, you get to know people. But when you're doing a movie that's shooting over, you know, eight weeks or something, you have to very quickly ascertain their concerns mm. right and that involves a lot of conversations in your prep for the costume and i try and really dissect the script pertaining to them before i make my first phone call to them and say you know you have this scene where you know you have to drag somebody or or you're you're uh it's winter but we're shooting it in in summer and do you you know mm -hmm. you have lots of conversations about their comfort level because they have to do their job and if you're dragging at them with something that's uncomfortable, doesn't fit right, too hot, too heavy, you're not allowing them to do their job. Wow. Yeah. The Bolakai. Holy cow. You know, what? it's talking about like taking Ronan Dex to the extreme, you know, where you had to dress Danny Trejo mm -hmm. in this, uh, mm -hmm. th these, these outfits yeah. that were completely cobbled together. Yeah. and go hand in hand with their makeup and the tribes and everything else. What was the Bolakai like to design? 
Well, Danny Trejo is, is an amazing person. I've actually worked with him four times now. Wow. And that was the first time. And so he is a, he's almost, uh, he's a beast of sorts in that yeah. his, Questions. his, Valerie. Uh, he embraces things like crazy. I mean, we built his boots. We built the pelts that we use to get that feeling of him and his, and his cohorts mm -hmm. were just such an adventure. I mean, that was a um, piecing things together and adding, adding things that they scavenged, mm -hmm. you know, really being cognizant of all that and having branches and making them look like moss and, you know, adding that to costumes. That was a super, super creative, creative adventure with him. And he, he was so great when he was in the tent and it was just all. I really wish that they hadn't been a one-off. You know, I really yeah. wish that we had had a chance to see that culture a little bit more. Cause I think that there was more going on there with that tribe than meets the eye. Oh, definitely layers and layers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> definitely. But that was a, an incredible episode to do. And, and I, like you um, would have loved to have seen them more because we had so much fun doing, doing the costumes. Uh, Will Rab. I've got a rather close screen accurate SGA costume, he says, for combat vest, shirt, et cetera, com for cosplay that he uses for airsoft competitions. And he says, I'm not sure if you played a part in designing them, but if you did, were the utility pouches purchased from a company or were they made on set? Because I know you were referencing a military surplus store. Yeah, I, you know, that's actually a prop okay. and I wouldn't accurately know the answer to that. Okay, that's fair. All right. And who, who was your, your props counterpart? Uh, Is it still Evil uh, Kenny? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kenny Gibbs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've tried to get him on the show. He hasn't returned my calls yet. <laughs> I have not seen him in a couple of years, so oh. he might be out. He, he could indeed be. You know, it's yeah. how has it been watching the industry just explode up in Vancouver? I mean, I know it, it was a small club for, for a real long time. And, and a lot of the people that I talk with are still working up there. And they're like, it's not the same town anymore. Mm. You know, you guys have yeah. been really fortunate. And I think, you know, especially this year, we were, we opened pretty early. You know, we were open beginning of July and uh, with, with many, you know, protocols in place. And it's been such an adjustment. But it also exploded up here because it was inconsistent in the States a bit at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were even busier than usual, to be honest. Um, it's now taking a little bit of a breath, you know, um, because we now, we now have many producers that are used to being up here. It's really a joy to work with the same producers. Um, we have some really talented crews up here, you know, so I, but it has changed so much, so, so much. And I, I'm glad that I was there when I was there, let's just say, and that I was in that beautiful cocoon of Stargate mm. for so long where only wonderful things happened to us. You know, it was the most creative, energized, friendly, family-oriented group that you could ever... I've yet to encounter that again, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Kudos to to Brad and Robert for, for creating that environment. Um, yeah, I mean, and also because I haven't done a big series of that length since then, so that may be part of it, but word is that it's more business now than it is family. When it's, when you are in the trenches for 17 yeah. seasons of television, mm -hmm. if you are going to get through it with any degree of a plum, yes. there is no reason for it to be a pain in the ass, Val. <laughs> no. As much as, I mean, for certain circumstances there, I mean, there's going to be bad days. Of course, yeah. there's going to be bad days, like any family, but you get through it. Yeah. You do. And you're, and I think a lot of us, to be honest, when, and I'm sure the fans will agree with this. We were very saddened by, by um, Stargate Universe, you know, not going forward. And it was because that was an extension of the family of SGU and Stargate Atlantis, you know, and we're so fond of each other. A lot of, a lot of the crew had been with that company for 10 years, seven years, 17 years, you know, they didn't know where else to go really. Right. Their cars just went automatically to the bridge studio. Right. So I've, I've felt a real sadness for a long time after it was gone because I, uh, it was such a joy to be there. What do you think about um, uh, Brad 
at trying to get a fourth Stargate series off the ground. Would you be game for uh, the fourth? In a second, in a second. I just know the integrity that, that, that Brad has and the creative juices that flow when he's at the helm. So 100%. Uh, and Kappa 1611, I want to piggyback off of what I just asked. In a perfect world for you, mm -hmm. were an SG4 to be on the table and present it to you as another project, mm -hmm. we had a more, a little bit more of a lighthearted show in SG1, a little bit more dreary in SGU, uh, adventurous in SGA. From a costuming perspective, what kind of tone would you prefer for an SG4. What do you want to design next? Were you given a chance to play in that sandbox for a, for an 18th season overall? I mean, that is really, I would love to be um, off world, okay. visiting a new civilization every, <laughs> that would be the challenge I would want. So no military surplus. You know, you got to have some military to keep the peace, right? Yeah. And that has been a grounding factor in every one of the franchises. Yeah, yeah. That's but I'd like true. to create that military. They'd be future. Anything else that you'd like to to, to say, Valerie? The the, um, the 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 fandom has just continued to embrace this thing. You know, ten years after it's been off the air. Um, and anything any anything that I've missed that that you want to to bring up and incorporate before we let you go. I think we've covered a lot. I would like to say thank you to the fans because the enthusiasm and the support of the fans throughout the whole adventure was so important to us. You know, we used to have a lot of them uh, visit set mm. when they would, you know, win, win a, a lunch with, you know, Joe Flanagan or whatever. And we always got to meet them. Sometimes I got to dress them, you know, <laughs> so we finally, we got to meet those people that supported us through all those years. And, and I think that's the, one of the most important things that we felt. Well, I really appreciate you taking some time to walk down memory lane with me on this show. It's, it's certainly an, an important part of my life. You know, I know it was a, such an important part of, of yours. I can't remember the name of the gal that we worked with when we were boxing all the uh, SG1 Atlantis costumes up for, for prop works. But um, I, I hope she is uh, doing well uh, as well. What was her name? Was that Nancy? Was Nancy. it Nancy? She's amazing. Yeah. Girl, I think it might have been Nancy. She's well, joyful. She's now a physiotherapist. Wow. Okay. And has a little and has a family. So wow. you know good for it was her. like target or nothing. <laughs> Valerie, thank you so much for this. Thank you for sitting down with me. It's, it's so good to catch up with you. Great to see you again. Thank so, you. So you're so you're busy on another project? Everything's everything's trucking along? Absolutely. Okay. It's it is busy up here and I've been able to I always um look for the adventures, right? I just right. did a uh, musical Western and I actually <laughs> did a Western with Danny Trejo as the bad guy. Oh. Again. And, uh, you know, that's what we're looking for is I'm trying to keep one foot in that adventure bordering on sci-fi world. So I'm ready for the fourth one. Good for you. Thanks so much to Valerie Halverson for joining us in this episode. As always, it's 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 a pleasure uh, communicating with her and uh, and having her share some some stories. I'm hopeful that she will help us open some doors in terms of getting Christine Mooney and um, Christina McQuarrie on as well in uh, the near future. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. But if you want to support the show a little further. Consider buying yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages in a variety of sizes and colors at Redbubble. Checkout is fast and easy, and you can even use your Amazon or PayPal account. Just visit dialthegate.redbubble.com, and thanks for your support. We do appreciate you tuning in. My team, I, I, they're just terrific. Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, Anthony, Jennifer Kirby, Linda, Gate Gabber Fury. I really appreciate you guys helping me make the show happen. And those of you who tune in each and every week, I know who all of you are. And thank you for so much uh, for, for tuning in. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. We'll see you on the other side.